All right, we're in part two of our series in the book of Ephesians, and we're going to be looking at chapter two, all right? The first 10 verses, uh, Nyla beautifully read them to us, uh, the first 10 verses in the book of Ephesians. So if you have a Bible, you can meet me there. Uh, I'm not going to read it because uh, Nyla already did so, and so we're going to jump in. But, but here's what Paul is doing. He, he's, in a sense, uh, reminding the church, right? So he, remember, he's speaking to the church in Ephesus. He's speaking to people who've crossed the line of faith. They, they believe in Jesus as Lord and Savior. And so what he's doing is he's reminding them of who they used to be. Because we are forgetful people. And because we are forgetful people, we, we can take the gospel, the, the beauty of the gospel, and make it a normal thing in our lives. And it is not. It is not a normal thing. And so what he does is he says, I just want to remind you, before we jump into some practical things of what does marriage look like, what does family look like, what does your work life look like, before he jumps into all of that, he says, I, I want to take some time to remind you of who you used to be. But as he does that, I also, he's recognizing that in the gathering, there are people who probably aren't Christian. The same like this gathering. I don't want to assume. And, and so my hope is as we unpack these words, if you are not a Christian, that, that you might for the first time maybe go, okay, hold on, let me assess my life here and recognize where I am with the hope, with the hope that the Holy Spirit will take a hold of your heart and bring you closer to our Father through Jesus. And so, this is what Paul does. Right out the gates, he gives us a snapshot of who we were before Jesus. We see this in verse 1. He says, and you were dead in your trespasses and sins. He says later again in verse 5, even though we were dead in trespasses. And our trespasses and in our sin, trespasses is deviating from the right course, crossing a boundary, breaking a command. It's like there's a big sign that says, you shall not, but we do. We cross that boundary over and over and over again. And so therefore we are guilty. We are dead in our sins because we fall short. We fall short of the glory of God. What God has commanded of us, we fall short. And so Paul says here, you were dead. You were dead in your sin and trespasses. Not just sick, not even in ICU. No, no, no. You were dead. You were in the morgue. No hope. No possibility of life. Paul wants us to understand the true nature of our condition before Jesus so that we might recognize how much we needed Jesus. And maybe you're sitting here and you're not a Christian. I want you to know how desperately you need a Savior. Because you're not just sick. You are dead, dead in your trespasses and dead in your sin. But Paul adds to this. And so let me read verse 1, but let me show you what he says in verse 2 and 3. He says, And you were dead in your trespasses and sin, in which you previously walked according to the ways of this world. According to the ruler of the power of the air, the spirit now working in the disobedience, we too all previously lived among them in our fleshly desires, carrying out the inclinations of our flesh and thoughts, and we were by nature children under wrath as others were also. What, what Paul does here in verses 2 and 3 is he lists out our three enemies who love to keep us in our state of deadness. He's saying, guys, you, 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 your, your reality is that you were dead. And here who loves, here's who loves to keep you in that state of deadness. Our three enemies. We see Satan, the world, and our flesh. Satan, the world, and our flesh. Satan, he says, according to the ruler of the power of the air, the spirit now working in the disobedient. By the air, Paul means the spirit realm. Well, we're going to see this later in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12, where he says, For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers and authorities and cosmic powers of the dark world. Friends, Satan is real. Yeah. And, and I know what we've, we've tried to do is, as culture and society is, is to kind of maybe put a few horns on him in a tail, and paint him red and go, okay, he's like a boogeyman. No, no, no. Satan is real, and he wants to keep you in your state of deadness. Yeah. And he will do everything everything, everything in his power to keep you there. He's a real enemy. 
And this is why we pray. This is one of the, the many reasons that we pray, the importance of prayer, because we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the darkness of this world. The power of prayer allows us to engage. And so Satan is a real enemy, but, but then Paul says that the world is also your enemy. Now you might go, oh, this is confusing. I thought God so loved the world. Well, w- think of the world in two ways. Uh, when we read the scriptures, we're, sometimes we'll read the, the word world, and there he's talking about people, you and us, you and I. That God so loved the world, he loves us as people, as image bearers. But then there are times where we'll see the word world, and here it's referring to the value system of this culture. That value system is not always for us. It is not always for us. And so we need to be careful. And then lastly, your flesh. It says in our fleshly desires, carrying out the inclinations of our flesh and thoughts. And we were by nature under the wrath as others were also. Our flesh, the cravings of our flesh, wants to keep us in our state of deadness. And so we need to be aware of our three enemies. Be aware of them. These first three verses are often referred to as the death valley. That is where we were before Jesus. Death valley. And Paul's description puts us right at the bottom of it. With no escape. Or so it seems. These three verses in chapter 2 of Ephesians also function as a three-verse summary of the first three books of Romans. It's beautiful. The, the, the first three books or chapters, sorry, of Romans. Another letter that Paul wrote, where Paul teaches on the total depravity and death of humankind. Now, this is something that many of us don't like to talk about. Total depravity. It's not a, a favorite topic. See, the biblical doctrine of depravity means that every part of of the human person is contaminated, infected, polluted, and stained by sin. And all of us, all of us before Jesus are totally depraved. That apart from Christ, we are totally lost. Our depravity is so great that near the end of his argument in Romans chapter 3, here's what Paul writes. He says, as it is written, there is no one righteous, Not even one. There is no one righteous. There is no one who understands. There is no one who seeks God. No one. Now, now it might be confusing because we often hear people going, no, so-and-so is searching after God. So-and-so is seeking after God. And, And while that may be true, that they are seeking the peace or the hope that salvation brings... If we are to believe God's word and not just our emotions, we would see that it is only the Holy Spirit that prompts the heart of a person. That left on our own, we will not search for God. We won't. Why? Because we are totally depraved. And that it's the Holy Spirit that tugs at our heart, that that says to us that this is not how we are to live. It's not a decision that you and I made. Friends, we would never choose God I want to make it plain. We would, we would, on our own, never, never choose God. It's because we are totally depraved. Every soul outside of Christ is in this death valley that Paul speaks of. Every single one of us who does not know Jesus is in the death valley. Ezekiel chapter 37, 1 and 3 says this, The Lord took hold of me, And I was carried away by the Spirit of the Lord to a valley filled with bones. He led me all around among the bones that covered the valley floor. They were scattered everywhere across the ground and were completely dried out. Then he asked me, Son of man, can these bones become living people again? O sovereign Lord, I replied, you alone know the answer to that. Only you know the answer to that. And friends, God does answer 
He does answer. In verses 4 and 5 of Ephesians chapter 2, God tears through the cosmic brokenness of our lives and reaches into the depth of the death valley. It says in verse 4, but God. But God. If you're looking for, for some favorite verses, here it is, right here. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 4. And, and friends, these two words alone should cause our, our, our souls to sing. But God, who is rich in mercy because of His great love that He had for us, made us alive with Christ even though we were dead in trespasses. Paul tells us here that God is rich in mercy. He's rich in mercy. So what is mercy? It's compassion or forgiveness shown to one's enemy or to someone who has wronged you. And we have wronged God. But He is rich in mercy. And because of the massive love He had for us, John 3.16, God in verse 5, we're told, made us alive. He made us alive. The, the phrase made us alive is, is a synonym for, for the phrase to raise from the dead. To raise from the dead. You see, humanity is so radically dead that we can only be saved by the radicalness. Is that a word? It is, it is now. The radicalness of a resurrection. That if you are a Christian, then you have experienced the resurrection power that we spoke of last week. If you are a Christian, God, in His, His mercy and, and love and by His power, pulls us out of the death valley and makes us alive. Essentially, humanity is divided into two groups. Those who are resurrected and those who are dead. There is no in between. And, and we will make excuse after excuse after excuse for people. Us, the church, no, but they're really, really a good person. They're really kind. Well, if they're separated from the love of God, none of that matters. It's only two groups. Those who have been resurrected and those who are still dead. Dead in their sins. See, no one can crawl out of the death valley. You simply can't. You have to be pulled out. You have to be pulled out. And God does that through Jesus' death and resurrection. He pulls us out. And all of this, all of this is an act of grace. In case you missed it, Paul tells us here, he, sa he says, you are saved by grace in verse 5. Just in case you missed it. Saved by grace. But wait, there's more. There's more. You're not just pulled out of the death valley. You're not just made alive. But you are raised up with Him, Paul tells us. And you are seated with Him in the heavens. So you're saved. You're pulled out of the death valley, raised to life, made alive, raised with Him, and then seated with Him in the heavens. Friends, this is incredible. It, like, it, it literally should blow our minds that, that, that we are seated with Christ in the heavens. I know that we are here now, but the truth of the gospel places us with Jesus. And where is Jesus? He is seated at the right hand of the Father. And so that is where you are. And hear this. Where you stand must be determined by where you are seated. Where you stand must be determined by where you are seated. S Psalm 1 says this. Blessed is the one who does not walk in the step of with the wicked, or stand in the way that sinners take, or sit in the company of mockers. Do, do, do you see the progression there? If we work it backwards, it's you, you're sitting with a company of mockers, then you stand with sinners, and then you find yourself walking with the wicked. Let me, let me give this example. I, I find it confusing when, when people make racist remarks, and then they say, 
oh, oh, I'm so confused. That's so, you know, out of character. That's not who I am. No, we just saw your walk. But we need to understand, where were you sitting? Where, 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 where was that place of comfort for you? You see, we pretend. We're really good at pretending on how we should walk. But we can only do that for so long. When the pressures of life hit us, we'll find out where you were sitting. Where were you most comfortable? When, when men are abusive, and then it's almost like, but I, I, don't, I don't understand what happened. I, I just, I, that's so, so not me. No, 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 it is you. Where were you sitting? Who was, who was the, the company around you? What were they feeding you? Because you're very comfortable where you sit. I mean, think about it right now. All of you sitting, you're very comfortable. What are you listening to? What are you feeding your soul? We're so confused when, when, when pastors come out with scandals and we're like, but it's confusing. Did you not hear the sermons? Did you, the way he prayed, the way he walked. But when we double click, we realize where he was actually sitting. He wasn't sitting with God. She wasn't sitting with God sitting in his word with God's people being poured into where you stand must be determined by where you sit and here for those who are in Christ we're told that we are seated with him we are seated with Christ he goes on to say in, in verse 7 so that in the coming ages he might display the immeasurable riches of his grace through his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. Let me paraphrase this. All of this is happening so that in the future God can show off. So that God can show off. In the future God will continue to show the exceeding riches of his grace to us. God will never stop dealing with us on the basis of his grace and will forever continue to unfold its riches to us throughout eternity. It's the gift that keeps on giving. This is why this can never get old. It never gets stale. It's never boring. It's the gift that keeps on giving. The richness of His grace. And so from verse 8 to verse 9, we find Paul here singing. He's singing a different tune. No longer in the death valley, but now he's on the mountaintop. He pauses to catch his breath and then summarizes the beauty of the gospel. He says, for you are saved by grace through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It is God's gift. Not from works so that no one can boast. This is one of the simplest ways to explain the gospel. These two verses beautifully unpack the gospel that you are saved by grace through faith. And, and this is, is not of your doing. It is a gift from God. And this, this goes against our popular culture. It really does. If we were to be honest, it rubs us the wrong way. See, we, we, we want a salvation that is achieved, not a salvation that is received. Be because because if, if, if we tell ourselves that we achieved this, then we think it gives us bargaining power with God. God, did you not see me grab hold of that rock to pull myself out of this death valley? Therefore, you must give me. Our salvation is received. And so it, it, it leaves us going, God, whatever you want. Whatever you want. Wherever you call me, I will go. Whatever you ask of me, I will do. Because I recognize, I recognize the beauty of the gospel received freely. See, if we believe in a gospel that says that we achieved it, it does two things to us. It either makes us self-righteous human beings because we create standards that are good enough for us to get over or, or just high enough for us to get over but not others. Friends, this is, this is not the standard perfection is. You are not the standard God is. 
But, but when we come up with a salvation that's, well, I achieved this, God and I got into a partnership to do this, you will become a, a, a self-righteous human being because you'll look to other people and you'll say, I'm better than you, I'm better than you, I'm better than you. Why are you not able to keep up to the standard that I have created? So we become self-righteous or we become utterly depressed because we, we, we fail over and over and over and over again instead of recognizing that, that this gift has been freely given to me. And it's by grace that I have been saved. And that grace covers shame and guilt. It covers our failures, our imperfections, our shortcomings. God initiates our salvation. He initiates it. And, and, and this should drive everything that we do. Even our evangelism, as we share the gospel with other people, we should recognize that it's God who initiates it's God who softens the hearts of people. So what is our responsibility in all of this? To tell people about the goodness of Jesus. And then to pray that God would soften their hearts. Think of that person, your next door neighbor, your colleague, your family member, your friend, who you're going, I, I, just, I really want them to know Jesus. We pray. We pray that God would, would reach into the death valley and pull them out. And so I try to figure out how do I get you around spaces where you would hear of this good news, where you would experience this grace lived out in the lives of people. God initiates our salvation, for you are saved by grace through faith. It's not your doing, but it's a gift from God. And then we're told in verse 10 that for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared ahead of time for us to do. Paul tells us here that we're God's trophy of grace. We're his masterpiece. Uh, the, the word workmanship in the Greek is poema, which is where we get the word poem. We are poetry in motion. God's masterpiece, because he lavishes grace upon us, and that grace changes our lives. See, we are created in His image. And then those who surrender to Jesus as Lord and Savior undergo a second creation. Michelangelo was once asked what he was doing as he chipped away at a shapeless rock. He replied, I'm liberating an angel from the stone. That's what God is doing with us. The difference is we're not angels. We are better than them because we are created in his image. Jesus didn't die for angels, he died for humanity. And we are in the hands of a great maker, the ultimate sculptor who created the universe out of nothing, and he has never thrown away a rock that he has begun working on, never. You might be sitting here covered in shame and guilt because you're like, I've given my life to Jesus, but nothing, nothing seems to be working. And you think to yourself, you know what, I'm, no, I've, I've, I'm of no use to God. That he, how could he love me? How could he use me? But hear this, God will never throw away a rock that he has begun his masterwork. Philippians chapter 1 verse 6 says this, I am sure of this, Paul writes, that he who started a good work in you will carry it out to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. He's not done with you. He's not done with your marriage. He's not done with your relationships. God is still at work. We are his masterpiece. He's chipping away at us. And God's tools are Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit. Chipping away at us to make us more and more like his son Jesus. God uses his word to shape us. This is why this is important. This is why we unpack God's word every Sunday. He's chipping away at us to make us more and more like his son. God uses community. This is why we encourage you to be plugged in. It's one of his tools to chip away at us to make us more and more like his son, Jesus. We don't say these things because it's like, well, it's because as the church, we're not really cool and we have nothing else to do. We say these things because as we read the scriptures, we realize that this is how God forms us, how he shapes us. 
We are his masterpiece, his workmanship, Paul writes. God will often use difficult circumstances and difficult people to shape us. That's one that I don't like, but it's true. It's true. He will use the suffering and the challenges in your life to mold you and shape you so that you might become more and more like his son Jesus. The master sculptor is still at work. He's constantly molding us, shaping us, carving us. Beauty to beauty, splendor to splendor, grace upon grace. I quoted him last week, and I'll quote him again. St. Augustine, or Augustine, depending on where you went to school, says this in one of his books, in chapter 8 of his Confessions. He says, Men go abroad to wonder at the height of mountains, at the huge waves of the sea, at the long courses of the rivers, at the vast compass of the season, at the circular motion of the stars, and they pass by themselves without wonder. We don't recognize the beauty, the beauty of the church. Friends, we are valuable in the hands of God. Th th this is why things like, like racism, just a, a racist Christian is an oxymoron. How? How? When you look at someone who's been created in the image of God, and then on top of that, they've surrendered their lives to Jesus and so uh, undergoing a second creation. God is molding, shaping to become more and more like Jesus. H how could you hate that? I wonder if we ever look at one another and just go, wow, look at God. Because I remember where you come from. So, so some of us have been around one another long enough to go, hey, I Look at the change. Look at the transformation. Look at God. We are God's masterpiece. Created in Christ Jesus for what? For good works. See, the gift of grace is not just a ticket to heaven that you get to put in your back pocket and then you do whatever you want. That's not what it is. We are saved for a purpose, friends. Jesus came to restore what was lost in the garden. This means that we will now, as new creations, saved by Jesus, filled with the Holy Spirit, we will be able to function as humanity was intended to function, as a thinking, reasoning, living being, pursuing life for the glory of God and doing the good things that God has called us to do in this world for the sake of His glory and for the expansion of His kingdom. Now, you might ask, what are, what, what are good works, on it? I'm glad you asked. Good works are loving God with all of your heart, your mind, and your soul. And then it's loving your neighbor as you love yourself. That's a good work. A good work is making disciples who will go on to make more disciples. That's a good work. Good works are, are, are living out of the fruit of the Spirit, showing kindness and being patient, being self-controlled, those are all good works. Serving one another in the context of this community is a good work. Pursuing justice is a good work. The, the, the Bible is, is filled with the good works that God has called us to do. And he, we're told that they are created in Christ Jesus for these good works. It's James who says, faith without work is dead. And there are many of us, many of us who say we have a faith but we have no works. And I'm not trying to judge you. I'm just saying maybe you need to assess your life. You need to examine your heart. Faith without works is dead. masterpieces created in Christ Jesus for good works which God prepared ahead of time for us to do. This one caught me by surprise. I've read Ephesians a couple of times. 
over the years, and I've, I've, I've preached it many times, but it, the first time I saw this, which God prepared ahead of time for us to do. This is telling us that no matter how impressive your works are, no matter how impressive your works are, God prepared them for us ahead of time. So, so, so there's, like, there's, nothing, there's nothing that you have done where God goes, oh my goodness. <laughs> that took me by surprise. No, it's because he, he, he prepared it. He prepared it ahead of time for us to do. Let me give you an example. Uh, during Easter, I know you can do this uh, any time of the year, but I remember it during Easter. During Easter, w- what we tend to do with kids is we have uh, these Easter egg uh, hunts, right? They, they hunt for Easter. I don't know why we do it. It's super weird. Um, but when you become a parent, you sign up to many things that you for a long time thought were super weird, and you do them. And so uh, we hide these Easter eggs, right? Maybe in the garden. You'll hide them around the garden in various places, and then you'll tell the kids, okay, go. And they'll search, and they'll search, and they'll search. And, and if you're a, a great parent, hides them really, really well. It doesn't make sense. Like, it makes no sense to me if you go, I'm going to hide it here. Right, go, buddy, go. Like, I, I, don't, I, don't, know, I don't know what you're trying to do. You've got to hide it really, really well where they can't see it. And obviously, they struggle a little bit because that's good, right? It's good for development. And, um, <laughs> and so they're searching and they're searching. And then after a while, you realize, okay, man, you have walked past that bush so many times and it's right there. So you, you, what do you do? You start to give words of encouragement little bit of direction. The kids listen to their father's voice. And if they listen, they stand a better chance of finding that Easter egg. Right? And it's like, what, 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 what did he say? What, what? A little bit to the left. Depending on how old your kid is, what is left? The other left. Okay, go, 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 go. Round the bush. Do you see something? Do you see something? On top. On t- and and like they're talking to their friends. They're saying, my dad is saying uh, over there to, and then they find it and man so full of joy yay I found it I found it right <laughs> which is totally fun but I put it there not only did I put it there I encouraged you on where to go I gave direction on where to go Hey, I still have a smile on my face when my kid finds it, right? Because I'm full of joy. I'm full of, like, man, this is great. That's God with us. He prepares these works and he says, you know what, just be obedient. Listen to my voice. Go, go, left, right. Don't do that. No, 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 don't hang out with them. Don't sit there. And then when you do it, we're so full of joy. We're so excited and so is God fills him with joy when we do that which we were called to do. That's what it means here. This God prepared ahead of time for us to do and yet is full of joy when we do it, when we are obedient to him. Paul here is telling us in Ephesians chapter 2, he's literally telling us that grace changes everything. That's the point of this text. Grace changes everything. Grace gives us a kingdom identity. It it completely changes who we are. Grace does that. Not anything that you do, but it's what's been done for you and then lavishly given to you. Grace changes our identity. And that's what Paul reminds us of here in Ephesians chapter 2. He says, before we start talking about the other things that grace changes, I need you to understand that grace changes everything. It changes your identity. That the gospel, the gospel literally comes into you and wrecks you. And you become a transformed new person. The gospel is not an add-on. It's not like an app that you download on your phone that makes your life a little bit easier. The gospel changes your entire being. And that's what Paul wants us to see here. He wants us to stand before the scriptures and go, okay, my life has been changed here. I'm no longer who I used to be. 
Because if I'm going to attempt to, to, to engage with others in a way that honors my Father, I need to first do that from a place of understanding who I am in Christ. This is why I use this, and I'm going to use it a lot throughout the series. I'm going to talk about the oxymoron. Because we need to call it out for what it is. A selfish Christian, that's an oxymoron. A greedy Christian, an oxymoron. Now, can I wrestle and, and with those things? Absolutely. But you don't identify yourself with those things. That's not who you are because grace changes everything. That's what Paul wants us to see. Because if grace changes our identity, grace then changes our culture. And that's what we're going to see next week and the weeks to come is that it changes our culture. So if our culture doesn't have the aroma of the kingdom, we need to ask the question, who are we? Who are we? As a church, who are we? We have to ask that. I think too often we, we, we ask the wrong questions. In trying to diagnose the situation, we're asking the wrong questions. And so what ends up happening is we come up with program after program and methodology after methodology and system after system, which are all great things. But I think we need to pause and say, I think the issue is here. I, 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 maybe I haven't crossed the line of faith. Maybe I don't know Jesus. I'm still in the death valley. I am pouring perfume after perfume after perfume, but I still smell of death. And so we pray that God would save many. Save them. Save us. So that we might live out of our gospel identity. So that we might do gospel work as this happens, God gives us the necessary power and He gives us the wonderful sense of the Holy Spirit to fuel us so that we can do that which He has called us to do. There is nothing more beautiful than that. Nothing more beautiful than to see God's people at work glorifying Him. And so I'll leave you with a simple question. Has the grace of God transformed you? Has it really transformed you? Or are you living a life of pretending, performing? It's a real question. And if you have crossed the line of faith, if you are a Christian, if you know that you've been pulled out of the death valley, where are you sitting? Whose company do you keep? And I'm not just talking about friends. But are you, are you sitting under the Word of God, having it poured over you? Are you sitting with other children of God as they love you and serve you? Or is Sunday morning just another opportunity for you to come and pretend and perform? God wants so much more. He, he really does. He's prepared it. We're told here, prepared all of this ahead of time for us to do. Will you step into that? Will we step into that as a church? And so, Father God, I pray that you would take these simple words, these simple truths and anchor them in our hearts. Holy Spirit, would you take a hold of our hearts where conviction needs to happen, would you do so? Convict us of your truth. For those who have crossed the line of faith, for those who say, yes, I, I am a believer, I am a child of God, but I don't live the way that you've called me to live. Holy Spirit, I, I pray that you would stir in us a passion for your name. That you would reignite once again. 
I pray for those who are carrying guilt and shame. And we've believed the lies of the evil one. That, that no one wants to hear about those things. That if they do, then they'll, they'll think different of you. That's a lie from the very bottom of the Death Valley. God, we know that you cover our guilt and shame. That Jesus died for all of it. And so because of that, we can freely stand and say we are forgiven. Help us, Lord. Help us to truly understand what it means to be children of the kingdom. We love you, Lord. But we can only love you because you first loved us. Have your way. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.